Hey, y'all. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for asking. It's me, Kim, back for another video. Today, I'm going to be talking about She's Gotta Have It season two. So She's Gotta Have It is a Netflix series in its second season. It stars DeWanda Wise, who is just gorgeous and radiant and talented. It was created by Spike Lee. And the premise for the Netflix series originated in a 1986 film by Spike Lee of the same name. So that movie from 1986 was a real, like, cultural milestone. It was Spike Lee's first big feature film. Like, that's what really got him noticed. It featured a Black woman protagonist in this polyamorous situation, which was definitely a new thing for that time. It's a new thing for now, honestly. We really don't see that a lot. Um, really, really groundbreaking in many, many ways. And the first season of this show was a disappointment. I'll put it lightly. And I went back and watched season two, despite my feelings about season one, because I should love this show, right? I think this show has so much potential. I love DeWanda Wise. She is just really it for me. I hope she gets so many more opportunities. I loved her in Something Great, the other Netflix movie. And there are so many other beautiful, talented women of color in this show. I like Anthony Ramos a lot. I have feelings about his character. I like Spike Lee. I respect what Spike Lee has done for cinema in general, American cinema largely, and for black cinema in particular. So there are lots of pieces to this that if they are put together in the right way, I should go up for this show. On paper, I am there. But the execution, the execution is just, not only do I not love this show, I actively dislike it. So I feel bad because this is about to be a drag. <laughs> I feel bad. Okay. So there's been a lot of social media chatter about a particular scene in this series. And if you've seen the chatter around it and seen that clip, that clip really exemplifies the poor writing that really tanks this season. And I'll say right off the bat, I love TV. I love watching TV. I'm around a few people who are kind of snotty about the fact that they don't watch TV. Like, oh, I'm too good for that. And I was listening to NPR recently and this NPR report was like, a lot of heavy TV watching is synonymous with like lower class status. And I was just like, okay, well, I'll just be a brokey McBrokerson <laughs> because I am passionate about television watching. But it was so hard for me to get through this show. It was, it's taken me a week to get this review up because that's how long it's taken me to make it through this show. And that is rare. That's how much I did not like it. But... I want to be as positive as possible. So what I'm gonna try to do is alternate the positive about this show with the negative feelings I have for this show until I run out of positive things to say. So I'm somebody who grew up loving Spike Lee films and loving New York and wanting to move to New York in large part, well, in part because of Sex and the City. Sex and the City made New York just look amazing and glamorous and sexy. But on the other hand, I loved it because of Spike Lee films. I grew up wanting a brownstone in Harlem because of how Oh, Harlem or Brooklyn, because of how gorgeous Spike Lee makes New York look. He makes it look like Xanadu, like a utopia. And that love for New York comes through in every single frame of this show. It is beautiful. The cinematography, the lighting, not only does he love New York, but he loves black people in the diverse array of tones and shades that we come in. The cinematography, it's, it's on another level. There was a budget for this show, clearly, and they used that budget very wisely when it came to the visuals of this show. But unfortunately, Brooklyn has the best story arc in this show. 
DeWanda Wise carries this show. I've already kind of gushed about her a little bit, but I just think she is that good. She is that gorgeous. And despite the fact that Nola Darling is written as an asshole, like, she is intentionally unlikable, I think. DeWanda Wise plays her to be... She's so charismatic and radiant. And you understand watching this show that despite the fact that Nola is a complete just terrible human. You understand why people are drawn to her because of DeWanda Wise's light. It ain't the writing that does that. That's something that only a a particular kind of it factor can do. And she did it. So like I said, I want her to get more, more opportunities, better opportunities, bigger opportunities, because she's really, really good. And, you know, I always appreciate small boob representation. And she's also a braids influencer. Those braids, okay, those braids get second billing, okay? DeWanda Wise at the top, braids second. She's Gotta Have It is supposed to be an updated retelling of that original film from the late 80s. But it doesn't feel like Spike Lee is committed to telling a contemporary story. So much of this just feels out of place. It feels dated. It feels retro in the worst ways possible. And when I was thinking through what my issue with the storytelling was, I don't want to be ageist. I don't want to be ageist because you know what? Older people make dope shit all the time. Younger people make whack shit all the time. But I think that if you're telling us that this character is supposed to typify the ethos of a black millennial woman, it is a real drawback to not have black millennial women telling the story. Now, I know all shows have writer's room and the writer's room of this show might have a couple of young women, but Spike Lee directed most of the episodes. He or his siblings or um, another woman named Rada Blank, who is in her 40s, wrote the episodes. And so when I looked to see who was getting the the credits on each of these episodes, I was like, "Mm, that sounds about right, because In this show, I don't feel a love and care for the story of a black millennial woman, right? I I feel in this show a lot of talking down. I feel a lot of judgment. It feels like an older person's interpretation of what goes through a black millennial woman's mind. And I can see it because I'm 30. I can see it. (laughs) Okay, we can all see it. So maybe if authenticity is what you're striving for, it is always best to tap into the the demographic that you're trying to portray. And anyway, if you're right, if you're white trying to write about black folks, you need to talk to black folks. If you're older trying to write about young people, you need to talk to young people. I'm not going to go out and try to write a South Asian queer man story because I don't it's not it's not for me, you know, and I think sometimes we get a little we get a little arrogant in thinking that um, we have the range. They don't have the range. They didn't have the range for this. It's someone's story, but it's not a black millennial woman's story. And I think that is where the crux of my disappointment in this show comes from, from because in a way it's just false advertising. I will always appreciate that Spike Lee is an artist that seems to take lifting up the race and inspiring the race seriously. I appreciate that. We see over and over again in this series that Spike Lee wants to highlight black creatives, black art, black history, black communities. And I I have a I have a a little bit of a beef with that which I'll get into later, but that is a worthwhile undertaking. And even though the, the depictions of women aren't all the way there, he is certainly exposing uh, a great many people to artists and names that they might not have known before. You know, Zora's first, I mean, Nola's first lines in this series being from Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God felt a little cliche to me. It's just a little cliche because that text is now the text. But maybe I feel like it's cliche because I'm so familiar with that work. And like, that's kind of the, you know, the text (laughs) if you're under 35. 
But certainly there are people who are watching this show who that was their first exposure to it. And, you know, I'm never going to be mad at people for celebrating Black women artists in particular. Well, maybe I'm going to be a little mad because I'm going to get into what my beef is later. But okay. In the beginning of this series, it really focuses on Nola's relationship with her partner, Opal. And Opal's a little bit older. Opal has a child. And I love seeing that intimacy between them. I don't, you know, we still don't see a lot of Black lesbian love on platforms like this. And I just like to see new stuff. I always say all the time, show me some new stuff, okay? I don't want to see the same old stories. So I loved continually seeing that intimacy. However, there is a sex scene early on in this show. Now, I'm no prude. I watched the L word. I've seen lesbian sex scenes before, but I didn't sign up to see Zane Sex Chronicles. You know what I'm saying? The early sex scene in this show felt real male gaze-ish. It felt real, almost gratuitous and exploitative. It was just too long and they were just doing a lot. And then there's one scene, I don't know if this is going to be bleeped out, <laughs> but, but there was one scene when they were having sex and Z Nola was performing uh, an act below the belt. I'm trying not to get flagged by YouTube. And while she was performing this act on her partner, she was holding out her braids like this. Who does that? I was just like, I, at that point, I was like, nobody does. Who does that? Why would you put that in there? It's so weird. Don't do weird shit like that. Cause then it makes it into a joke. That's when I knew. That's what I knew. I said earlier that it's really clear that Spike Lee takes very seriously his opportunity to use his platforms and these movies and these shows to expose his audiences to black greatness, black creativity. And I appreciate that, but it's so didactic. It's so, it feels like we're watching a TED talk. It should not be, look, I want to learn more about Puerto Rico. I want to learn more about Oak Bluffs. I want to learn more about these great artists past and present, but we don't, we should not get there in a scripted series via, okay, kids, it's time to learn about Oak Bluffs. Okay, kids, it's time to learn about black art. Okay, kids, it's time to learn about Puerto Rico. That does not, that's not how you tell a story. And that's not an effective way to weave in those teachable moments when we're trying to follow a narrative. It takes us out of the experience of moving with these characters, of growing with these characters. It really bothered me because it feels like a crutch. There are ways to weave that stuff in without having it be a, um, an after school special moment. And there are this narrative that could have been interesting and compelling is dissected by so many of those just little, you know, too, it just, it's too preachy. Don't talk down to us. I'm just here for a good time, dude. <laughs> like, what are you doing? And there's no reason why when we are talking about Ralph Ellison or talking about Zora Neale Hurston or talking about, you know, the historically black community of Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard, why, there's no reason why I should be rolling my eyes. When Carrie Mae Weems comes out to give us a, a history lesson about black art, why? Uh, there's just a much better way to do that. And that connects to the fact that multiple times when I was watching this show, I was wondering, okay, so what genre are we working in? Is it a straight comedy? Is it a satire? Is it a parody? I'm familiar with Spike Lee's oeuvre, so I know that he can do the big zany satire like Bamboozled. I know that he can give us sweet, tender moments. You know, Crooklyn is one of my favorite movies. I know that he can do a little bit of action. Um, but there were certain moments in this show where it was just like, huh? What's going on? And for me, the Dean Hagen character really brought all of those tonal issues and the genre issues to the forefront because Dean 
comes in a few times, and Dean is the man who defaced Nola's art last season, and he comes in this season as a benefactor, as a big, as an artist with a lot of money, and he's white, and he's buffoonish, and, um, you know, he just, you know, that's what, what white men do, right? He came into the space, took up too much room, talked too loud, um, and Nola clearly has a lot of resentment toward him. But the Dean Hagen character is just so cartoonish. It's so outlandish with the grills and the way that he's speaking and the uhuru. I'm like, what type of, what are we, what are we trying to do here? Right? Because for me, it was just like, mm, cringy. I wasn't sure what we were trying to have him accomplish. But also if you're a white person watching it, it's really easy to write off a character like Dean because you get to say, oh, oh, that's not me. Well, at least I'm not, you know, I'm not out here saying it's nation time and Uhuru and all of that. I just think it lets people off the hook too easily. But also, it's not a new depiction. You know, Dean really felt to me like something that we saw on Chappelle's show, even though, I'm, you know, you know how I feel about Chappelle's show. But Dean, it's that's a depiction of the, the buffoonish, wigger, white person that we've seen before. Give us something new. Give us something different. Over and over again in this series, I felt like it was trying to do the absurdity thing and in la the first season, too. You know, Spike Lee is trying to balance absurdity with comedy, you know, with these, these teachable moments. And I feel like Atlanta is the best example of kind of um, an absurdist comedy that we have right now. It's so interesting. It's so thought provoking. And I think that if you're going to go that route, you got to stick the landing you know, so that we will either be kind of like, huh, you know, and then it'll force us to have these conversations um, or it has to be like right on top of it, right? You got to hit that note. This is just, it's so messy. It's so all over the place and you're just confused and it's not even interesting. And, you, and many times while I was watching this show, I was just like, <sighs> you know, like it wasn't an enjoyable watch for me. I love the music on this show. I really enjoyed it. I'm also an old soul. You know, Anita Baker is my favorite artist of all time. I've flown across the country to see her in concert multiple times. I loved it, you know, but I will say that the musical choices make this show feel retro. It makes it feel like who, whose story are we telling here through whose lens? Use of contemporary music, at least I have no problem with mixing old school music with contemporary music, but relying exclusively, almost exclusively on music made more than 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help. It doesn't help when the show already feels not like you're actually talking to millennials. On the other hand, I do, you know, one thing I thought about was if they had leaned, if the needle drops had been so much new music, younger music, it would be a lot like Insecure. And I wonder if they are trying to avoid that Insecure comparison because this show feels like insecure, but worse. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, and speaking of the music, there were pop culture references that were just so, okay. Like I said, I'm an old school. I play Anita Baker's Rapture album like it's new, but I'm still not out here talking to my boo, talking about, uh, girl, you need to change. Your, you know, I'm not referencing Eddie Kendrick's. I'm not referencing cool in the gang in my casual everyday conversations because I'm 13. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there were just so many of those old references that snuck their way into the dialogue. And I'm like, what are you, it ain't, that's not what we do. A big reason why it was so difficult for me to get into this show is because there's really no one to root for. Nola is the center of the show and she is as unlikable as they come. She's a carefree asshole. And that's not usually a deal breaker for me. I like all kinds of shows 
where the main character is an asshole. You know, I watch girls. I liked girls. I watch Shrill. I like Shrill. And I've been trying to check myself to see if I'm being too hard on her. But it's like, she's a bad partner. She's selfish. She's entitled. She has no boundaries or she doesn't respect other people's boundaries. Um, she's a bad friend. That stuff with her and Mars and Chloe is just beyond the pale for me. I'm sorry. You know, I go up for friendship and when somebody is a bad friend, I immediately write, write them off. What is the redeeming characteristic about Nola here? Is there a bright spot to her? You know, she was supportive of Shemekka in some ways, but mm, it just didn't, it was, it was not good for me. And the art isn't even good. You, you doing all that and giving us temperamental artists and the art don't even slap. It's hard. It's, it was, it's really difficult for me because not only is she an unlikable character, but all of the stuff that surrounds her is bad. We can, we can deal with unlikable characters. It's 2019. Like it's the era of the unlikable female protagonist, but it's like everything around her is bad. The situations that she gets in are not well written. The interactions that she have has are not great. The narrative structure and flow is bad. So what am I, what do I have to hold on to here? Nothing, <laughs> nothing. And the cast of this show is very good. I like Chloe. I like Shemekka. I really like Anthony Ramos. I thought he did everything he could with Mars. I love Joali. I, I stan her. I love her so much. I liked Rosie Perez, her little cameo, loved it. I loved Mars's sister, perfect casting. I wish that these very, very capable actors had better material to work with. I did love that Nola goes to therapy and she has this semi-open relationship with her therapist. I did have questions about how Nola pays for therapy. <laughs> you know, like, I'm sure she's on Obamacare. Like, how are you swinging that if you can barely pay your rent? But, you know, any positive depiction of therapy, therapeutic care, mental health care, I'm for it. Crooklyn is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's hands down my favorite Spike Lee movie. I loved the nod to Crooklyn early in this series when they are, Nola and Skylar are walking up those steps and they're singing one, two, three. Two, three, the devil's after me. Four, five, six, he's always throwing bricks. I like the character of Shemekka a lot. I like the fact that in this story, we're trying to show black women coming together from different class backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds and professional backgrounds. And I like that the Shemekka character didn't feel, she wasn't a token, you know, she's real. The problem is she didn't get enough to do. I think that her storyline the first season was completely botched. I didn't make a video about this, I don't think, but I was really disgusted. You know that I have very strong feelings about black women and body image and the negative way that media, the negative impact of social media on how we feel about ourselves and our bodies and the way that that was played out in the first season of this show absolutely disgusted me. I, I'm glad I didn't do a review of the first season of this show because that ru ruined it for me. Disgusting. It was disgusting to me. Okay, but anyways, Shemekka is back in the second season and she just, she came and went. She didn't get a whole lot to do. Her coming in and, and busting the woman who did her butt shots was supposed to feel like a this great triumphant moment in closing the story arc, but it came out of nowhere. There really wasn't any build up to it. All we saw is her looking in the mirror at her butt and not like, it was just like, you, we've got to have some character development, you guys. I'm sorry. That, that's a critical part of making a show. I also have questions about Jamie Overstreet's purpose. He comes in and out without explanation. His storyline really didn't add anything to the narrative flow. We get a, a another random gratuitous sex scene in here. I don't know why we needed to use that time on Jamie when that time probably would have been better spent developing the other women characters in this show. And again, it's like, 
it felt like She's Gotta Have It is supposed to be a show about this woman and her life and her friendships, but they didn't want to commit all the way to making a, a female centered story. And so you got to add these men in there to, to balance it out. And it's like, why? But why though? You know what I'm saying? Like, come in. Jamie had all these little scenes and I don't think that they added much. We didn't learn more about him. We didn't get a whole lot from it. There wasn't any payoff as his little portion of the story wrapped up. So why are we there? So then we get these little side stories with Jamie's wife that mm, didn't really do a lot for me. So she is trying to cope with the dissolution of her marriage and helping her kid cope and all of that. And, you know, I don't have a real problem with Jamie's wife confronting Nola because I'm always on team close your legs to married men, 100%. But the way that that interaction happened, it felt a little off to me. There's like, there's kind of a cliche of like, don't let this light skin and this uh, upper class tax bracket fool you. I'll whoop your ass. And it's like, mm, but will you? But will you though? And it's like, there's just something real disingenuous about that woman yelling world star ho at Nola on the street in front of your kid. Come on now. Who's doing that? No one. Anthony Ramos was just trying so hard. He really did what he could with Mars as a character. He was trying to add these, these quirks and these little flourishes with the ad libs and all that. But it was real cringy to me a lot of the time. It just, mm, you know, I love acting. I say this a lot. I love acting, but I don't want to see the effort. I don't want to see the work. And Anytime Mars was on screen, well, most of the time that Mars was on screen, we really saw Anthony working. Now let's get into the controversy. There was a little clip going around on Twitter and Instagram that was Nola talking to her new boo. His name is Olu and he's also an artist. And they get into these back and forth about race and art and representation. And they're both just saying real stupid, ignorant stuff. Black British actors are better suited than black American actors for stateside roles because they don't carry the burden of fucked up black American history. Almost two million kidnapped Africans who died during the Middle Passage. So you and your mans and your fellow black British blokes didn't come out of the shit unscathed. You just have Stockholm Syndrome and fell in love with your captors. Get and so that caused a lot of, you know, diaspora wars once again. Now, what I'll say about it is, I could not be prouder to be a black American woman. I could not prouder, be prouder to be a black Southern woman and I'll fight you over it. Somebody from the UK said something real ignorant about black Americans right after that clip started making the rounds and I was hot, you know, and I go out of my way not to tweet in anger and not to drag people, but I was angry, okay? But one place my anger will never lead me is xenophobia. That, that will never be my response to being mad at some silly shit that people from, that black folks from the UK say, or that um, African immigrants say, never, okay? I feel like we don't understand how closely aligned that xenophobia is to MAGA. Okay, that's a, it's a stone's throw away from make America great again, red hats, America first, okay? And I, I feel like black folks feel like we are exempt from perpetuating that shit. We are not, we are not. And then I see black Americans being like, oh, I'm not xenophobic, I just don't like foreign blacks. That's the same thing. <laughs> Those things are the same, okay? So we can talk about how black folks in the United States who are immigrants, who are not descendants of enslaved people on this continent, how they might be perceived differently, how they have privileged, how they are treated differently. We should have those conversations. But I can easily have that conversation without going MAGA on you. Easily. It's not hard. That thing that Olu said about uh, black immigrant actors being better suited to portray black American icons or whatever, that 
mirrors very closely what Ava DuVernay said about why David Oyelowo was the right choice to play Martin Luther King in Selma. And I had a huge problem with that. And I am very surprised that that did not create a bigger controversy because she literally said they black, um, black specialty trained theater actors don't have the cultural baggage of growing up learning those speeches. That is offensive. We need to call that out. It's not right to say that. But I am not going to go to fuck those Africans. And I was so grossed out by Nola going there when she was intentionally mispronouncing the names, those African names and the Latino names. I'm like, it don't make sense to me that Nola with her Afrocentric black is beautiful parents that she would then think it's funny to make fun of African names. Why insert that kind of xenophobia? I don't, it don't make sense to me. And then you already have a character that we don't like cause she's an asshole. And now, and now she's making fun of those foreign names, those non-white, non-Anglo names. And I, that was a bad choice. So that whole back and forth with Nola and Olu, both of them were wrong. They were both wrong. It, that was just a scene of facile people being facile, silly ass conversation, didn't make no sense. No points were made. There is no one, no black person living in the West is a tabula rasa. Nobody is a clean slate. We've all been conditioned. So what are y'all even fighting over? What, what, it don't make sense. And then, and this is why I think it's such a, a shame that these shows write towards social media instead of writing to tell a story. Because yeah, I guess if the if the desired outcome was to create a, a back and forth and a firestorm and a brouhaha on the internet, you did it. But the writing was shitty. And what did you prove? And where did it take the story? I do think one thing that Olu was right about is Black artists do spend a lot of time talking to and for other black people. And that probably is constricting. That's the one thing that I was like, oh, okay, well, that's a, that's a point. But everything else was trash. The focused moments of this show are the best moments of this show by far. When we're not doing all that extra bouncing around and two long shots and weird faces and black parties and speeches and all that, when we're just doing dialogue, relationship, connection. When we get to see two very talented actors on screen together, those are the best moments of the show. And it's sad that those moments are continually cut short all throughout this series. I thought Opal and Nola had wonderful chemistry. I like Chloe and Nola's relationship. I liked Chloe's relationship to Mars. I mean, you know, I didn't like it, but I liked their chemistry. There's so much good acting in here that's just overshadowed by the creators of the show, the maker of the show, just trying to do too much. Oh, I liked Nola and Greer together. I already said I like Nola's therapist. I liked Mars' sister. Um, I liked Nola's art friend. I don't remember what her name is, but she was cute. The actors in this show are really good, except for Fat Joe. It's just everything around it that's just a mess. The scenes in Puerto Rico really didn't make no sense. It really just felt like, oh, we have a budget to do it, so let's go. And I don't blame them. Who wouldn't want to go to Puerto Rico? I also appreciate Spike Lee's continually spotlighting the connection between Black Americans, Latinos, Afro-Latinos. That's a real strong foundational point in this whole series. There's one scene where Mars and Nola are riding their bicycles through the streets of Puerto Rico, and they're saying, yo soy Boricua, and that don't make no sense at all, but it was cute. It was cute. Um, there are multiple references to Santeria and to Yoruba religious teachings. Oshun is mentioned multiple times. Everybody is Oshun. Apparently, the only the only <laughs> Yoruba deity that we reference is Oshun. Everybody's Oshun. Everybody's the daughter of Oshun. <laughs> Which okay, Oshun is that bitch. But still, <laughs> you know, maybe we can uh, branch out a little bit. And I did love that the beautiful like Afro Latina woman in Puerto Rico who was dressed in all yellow like Oshun, you know, it's just good to see beautiful, you know, dark skinned women strutting their stuff on the streets. But 
you know, a little predict, just a little, but I'm okay with that. A little predictable. <laughs> Another bizarre choice and moment was when Rosie Perez, whom I just, how can you not love her? Um, she is in Puerto Rico with her son, Mars. I don't know what her name is in this show, but she sits Mars down and they have a moment where she reveals to him that the man that Mars thinks is his father is not actually his father, which literally came out of nowhere, literally came out of nowhere. Okay. When she told him your father's name is Mookie, Mookie from Do the Right Thing, that is a point in this show where I said, what the fuck is happening? I hate this show. I literally said out loud, what the fuck? I hate this show. Cause it was so random, so completely out of the blue, so unnecessary. It's just like, come on, come on. I forgot to mention another choice that I just thought was real strange when they're on the artist retreat on Oak Bluffs and Nola is kind of falling for Olu and she thinks that he's just so sexy. A weird choice to me was that his medium is cow dung. Okay, weird as fuck. And then when she, Nola is just walking around one night and she goes up to his little artist shack or whatever, his little studio, and he is sculpting cow dung naked with his bare hands and she's just outside of his little window looking at him and then she touches her boob huh who is a, who is responsible for depicting nola sexuality what are we supposed to get from this i don't i don't get it i don't get it things that i think are supposed to be transgressive just feel weird it feels weird it feels out of place it feels gratuitous Strange. I don't think that the show does enough to address what a horrible friend Nola is to Chloe in Dating Mars. I feel like we just gloss over it. It is a big deal for me. That is an inexcusable violation. Maybe it's not for other people, but I just feel like there are enough men on the planet where you do not have to sleep with somebody that I was in love with. It doesn't make sense to me, especially when you know that I'm not over them. That's an it. How are y'all still friends? And y'all just pretending like it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't be me. It would not be me. One thing that this show does a lot is write about social media and write towards social media. So many of these conversations are ripped straight from Twitter when after Nola and Greer, and by the way, I loved Nola and Greer's little relationship. I like that you can sleep with somebody and still be cool with them and embrace their new girlfriend. Very progressive, very great, very forward looking. Um, but after they go see that movie at BAM and they're sitting at the pub or whatever, and Nola goes off about white, that's such a white feminist thing to do. And I was like, y'all stole this shit directly from Twitter. Don't do that. We're tired. You know, instead of actually consulting millennials and Gen Z, y'all just pulling up some tweets now. It's lazy. I think Nola's art is bad. I don't think that she's a good artist. And so because the center of this show is about her art and her quest to be a real artist and stay true to her artistry, the fact that I think the art is bad really takes me out of it. And I love Tatiana Fazliza Day. <laughs> I don't know how to, Tatiana Fazliza Day. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Um, she did the Don't Tell Me to Smile campaign. I know that she probably did a lot of Nola's art. Um, I don't have anything against her, but I just thought what they were presenting as this great transgressive work did not hit the note for me. I hated the last episode of this series. Hated it. I hated it. It, another, it was another episode ripped straight from the tweets. But I did like, one, one piece of art that I did like was the triptych with Nola in the center and her parents on the side. But that final piece of art was disgusting to me. I hated it. I was disgusted by it. I thought it was vulgar. I thought it was pornographic. I thought it was unnecessary. I thought it was unoriginal. That's the worst part about it. We have seen images of black people hanging themselves with their hair or with their own handkerchiefs or whatever and draped in the American flag. We've seen that before. So not only are you gonna do this nasty, disgusting, traumatic image, you gonna have an unoriginal image at that? It's just so 
don't, you know, by that time, after I'd sat through nine hours of this, I was just like, y'all suck. Everybody involved, go back to the drawing board. It was not good. What this show really did for me was to underscore that sometimes having too much time is a bad thing. It was just too long. If they had been forced to edit some of these episodes down to just 30 minutes instead of them being 40 minutes, 45 minutes, we probably would have gotten somewhere. There was just too much time to do too much stuff and not enough meat. There were no, there was not meat on the bone. So instead of getting storylines, character development, plot arcs, things that would actually keep us enjoying this show and invested in the characters. What we got was teachable moments. We got TED Talks, we got speeches, we got performances that were too long. There are so many times in this show where the camera just lingers on a face for too long, where we're in a scene for too long, right? It's like they start ad-libbing and the director doesn't say cut and we just left it in. And we didn't think about the actual quality of those ad libs. It was too much. Everything but the kitchen sink was thrown into this show. Block party, art, sexuality. It's just too, we got to streamline some of our thoughts. And again, like maybe we benefit from constraints. You know, maybe we need somebody to tap us on the shoulder and say, huh, maybe we don't need 20 things in this. Maybe we just need 10 things, you know? Maybe we don't need to try to follow 10 characters. Maybe we just need to follow four characters this season. It's just too disjointed to be enjoyable for me. A while back, I saw this film by Arthur Jaffa. He's a famed cinematographer. I mean, he, I believe, was DP, director of photography on Solange's videos from A Seat at the Table, or he at least helped with Cranes in the Sky and Don't Touch My Hair. Gorgeous, you know I stand a seat at the table. Anyways, and that film was compiled images, so flashes of images and really short video clips, like two to three seconds, maybe five second video clips, images, short clip, images, short clip. That's what she's gotta have it felt like. But it wasn't artful, <laughs> you know, like that's the problem. You're, you're trying to tell a, a story like that. It doesn't work. This show was just not a fun watch. It was not enjoyable. It dragged, you know? I don't believe in high art or low art. I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I find joy in watching all kinds of stuff. I did not get joy. This did not spark joy for me. There were so many times when I was watching this show, you know, like I said, it took me a week. And s multiple times in every single episode, I would do that thing where you scroll down to the progress bar and check to see how many minutes you have left. And every single time I was like, oh, really? We still have 12 minutes, 10 minutes, eight minutes? That's a bad sign. That's a bad sign. The pacing was so bad. It was just not, it's a shame is what it is. I will give it to Spike Lee though that his sense of humor does come through a couple of times. George C. Wolf had a cute little cameo in here. I laughed at a couple of the one-liners, but it just wasn't enough to take me through. This show is aimless. I don't think we got where we were supposed to go or if we were supposed to go anywhere. I don't know if I know more about what Nola wants, what her desires are at the end of watching these nine episodes as I did at the beginning. I know that the final episode of this season was Nola making her big statement. What was the statement? I'm not, we, she didn't even articulate it for us. I, I don't know what we were supposed to get out of that. You know, and I'm okay with a show about nothing. You know, there are lots of shows about nothing that I deeply enjoy, but they're good. The show is not good. It's not special enough. It doesn't sparkle. It doesn't captivate. When people ask me, when I you know, tweeted like, I really did not like this show, and people are like, oh, should I watch it? I'm always like, you know, cause I support black art or whatever. I'm always like, watch it yourself. See for yourself if you like it. You might feel differently about it than I did. But I had a very negative reaction to it. So this is not a show that I would like recommend it all. It's a show that I would have on like in the background as I took out my braids, you know? You know how when you're trying to take out your braids, you just put something on? <laughs> That's what I would do with this show.
just have it on in the background, walk around, take care of business, but to sit down, it's not appointment viewing, certainly. And I'm glad now that there's enough enjoyable black art, black TV, black film, where I don't have to pretend like this is good, because I'm not. But I am really excited to watch When They See Us. I've heard nothing but rave reviews about When They See Us on Netflix. I am a huge fan of Ava DuVernay. I think Queen Sugar is underrated, enormously underrated and under-discussed, particularly when it comes to awards. Um, so that'll probably be my next major watch, but she's got to have it. Ain't it? It ain't it. And it'll probably get a third season, but I'm not looking forward to it at all. Anyways, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you guys so much for watching. It is June. That means that Patreon Appreciation Month has started over on the Patreon. I've committed to making a new piece of content, either a podcast or a video, every single day in June. So that's how I'm going to get through all of the suggestions. You guys have been sending me so many DMs and messages and emails and all of these things that I want to talk about over there that I haven't been able to. So this is the month I'm going to get to them. Go over to the Patreon, sign up, and don't miss those 30 new pieces of content for the month of June. We're going to do it. And I've already, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it. I've already done three. That's pretty good, I think. Pretty good. Three in three days. Pat myself on the back for that. Um, again, thank you guys so much to all of the patrons. I appreciate you. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Leave a comment. Send me an email. Message me on Instagram or Twitter. Sign up for the email newsletter. Buy some merch. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you next time. I think next time I'll probably be doing a review of When They See Us, probably. But just watch When They See Us, just in case. You know, protect your mental health. But I think that's going to be the next thing I do. And it's going to be sad and traumatic, but I've heard such good things about it that I have to watch it. Bye. See you next time.